Well, let's go ahead and get started. Could you tell us your name? LaRue Horsley. Rue, and um, what year were you born? 1938. All right, and where are you from originally? I was born in South Shore, Kentucky. I grew up in uh, Eden Park in the Portsmouth area. Graduated from Clay High School. Oh, great. Um, I've heard a lot of people um, talk about Clay. It seems like a really special school. What are your memories when you were growing up there? Well, it, it's, it is a very special school. It's a small school, uh, but it's very, um, I mean, it's very student oriented. And um, it's just a, a wonderful place to grow up and raise kids. I know uh, even in today, I have friends that had went to Clay and they, they know everybody in their school, they know everybody's name, and I always thought that was really special. Oh yeah, and, and over the past uh, 10 to 15 years, Clay's had some wonderful growth in the area of their scholarship for students. And um, I've been happy to be a part of that, and it's been, it's been a wonderful thing to see um, this, the community come forward and when there's a good way to, to get money back to the kids, they always come through. And it's, it's just been a very gratifying to see that happen at Clay, even though the smallest school in the county, uh, I think we're leading in scholarship fundraising. So, oh, yes. That's great. And you said you were involved with the, making those scholarships. How, yeah, how well, I, have been, I did for 10 years, and um, I'm still uh, active, you know, like this Saturday, if I can plug that, um, November the 1st, we're having the big uh, Christmas bazaar, 40 vendors, and that all, all the money goes to the scholarship fund. So we invite everybody to come out and enjoy it. That's great. I've been to that event before. It's a really good one. Thank you. And um, so is there, do you have any uh, special stories or memories tucked away from your time at Clay when you were a kid? Well, uh, not in particular. I, uh, I was a work-oriented student. So by the time I was a sophomore, I was looking for a job, and, and I ended up getting a, a couple of part-time jobs and got me through high school, and, and then um, graduated and, and went away to go to school at, in Columbus, Ohio. So um, it was just a, Clay was just an, always a wonderful experience. Um, I frankly have no bad memories of going to school there, none. That's great. Yeah. And where did you, you went to school in Columbus at Ohio State? Well, I went to Ohio State, went there, went for a while. Um, of course, um, there were a lot of demands on um, students at the time. The scholarships weren't as available as they are now. But in the long run, it was better for me because I ended up being in a job that I loved. I got a job and then quit school and went back later and went to Hawking Tech and graduated. But I got into something I really loved and stayed with it through the years and I had a wonderful career. And I'm sorry, I was thinking in my head of a question for later. Would you remind me what, what job was it that you discovered? Okay, uh, it was at the Postal Service. And um, I ended up working there for uh, until about 1972. And then I, I got my own office and, and I did a, a few other offices and then came to Portsmouth in 1981 as postmaster. Oh, that's great. So I finished my career here in my hometown. Oh, that's, that's a really oh, it's wonderful marvelous. thing. It's just, like I said, you, you couldn't ask for anything better. It was just wonderful. Um, so how long were you postmaster down here at Portsmouth? I was 12 years here. Yep. Um, well, I... If you wouldn't care to indulge me a little bit, I don't know all everything that goes into being a postmaster. Would you like to tell me a little <laughs> about it? Well, <clears throat> the Postal Service, uh, when I started, uh, far cry from the Postal Service today. I don't mean that in a degrading way, I just mean it's different. Uh, information technology, you know, digital world and all, has really changed the way uh, we as a country communicate and pass our merchandise back and forth to one another. But the Postal Service at the time, it was a place I often characterize as having all the work I could do and everybody stayed out of my way. I mean, it was like um, 
there was so much work to do, so uh, and so many things um, coming up every day, and over the years it changed and changed and changed. But I, after about seven or eight years, I went into management, and and I just knew I was going to love working there the rest of my life. I just kind of dedicated my uh, my work side of my life to that, and it it paid off handsomely for me. I was able to retire at 54 with my retirement, and so I've had, um, I just had a wonderful time with the post office. And now it's a, again, it's an information technology type thing, uh, but um, it still hangs on to, and they're still available, a way to send that personal greeting. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever replace that with anything, but next to being there and touching somebody about the best way is to articulate that in in a message that you've written down yourself in your handwriting so, yeah. what were you the, what were the major things that you saw change from when you started working for the postal service to when you were finishing up well transportation one uh, was a huge uh, played a huge role in the change in the late 60s um, the train services that carried the mail back and forth throughout the United States changed drastically. And, and that was because of the interstate highways and trucking. And uh, trucking made it possible to move stuff instantly, practically between up to, up to 500 to 800 miles. Uh, you could get stuff there like overnight, uh, which before was unheard of. So as a result, the trains, uh, while they were the most economical way, they could not, they could not answer the public's demand for, uh, you know, getting things there quickly and so forth. So that was a huge change. And then, of course, uh, the next change, the next biggest, would have been the computer age. And uh, when that happened, you know, I often relate it to a story, my personal case. It was like 1980, and I had a, I was working in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, we had put in a new word processing system, the first uh, heard of in the post office. I mean, we were like an experimental place to put one in, and um, we started email. It was it, at that time it was uh, mostly inner office email, but I realized one day my secretary was bringing my email to me all printed out and I thought you know this can't be good I mean she reads my mail before I do I mean I mean I didn't care as much about her knowing what it was but I thought you know I really should have known this when she knew it if I'm going to be on top of things I should know it when she knew it. so I said I'm going to start so I took college courses and so within a couple of three months I was getting up on email and so I've been with it ever since. But um, that changed things overnight. I mean, at, at that point, uh, you know, each director had their own staff. You had a secretary, you had an administrative assistant or whatever. And it was just a personal thing. But we switched from that to, if I wanted to do a letter, I just picked up the phone, dialed a number, dictated the letter into the phone, it went to the word processing center, and in about 20 minutes, it was on my desk. I don't even have to type it. I mean, that's how much it changed. It was just, um, you know, uh, it was no no longer uh, necessary to have several staffs around. You had one centralized staff that were experts in, in dictation and, and steno work and typing and stuff. So, really upgraded the quality of our our hard copy that we were putting out. And then, of course, coming behind that, um, and if you jump, if you jump forward to today's world in the postal service, there is virtually no hard copy, almost none. Your boss now knows, regardless of the level you're in in the organization, your boss knows now what's going on at the same time you do. So all your mistakes are now glaring. No, your credits are glaring, but we all know you know the mistakes get the attention 
So it, it just made, well, you really have to be a different kind of manager now uh, versus the way it was before we had that instant gratification is what I call it. You know, it's, there's being a boss and having several bosses under you, you know, you live and die by what you know and when you know it. And to think that you instantly know what happened in a little town um, that's only got 300 people in it somewhere, if the mail carrier messes up or there's an accident, well, I mean, everybody knows it. So it just, it really changed things. And being able to react to that just had to be a different kind of person to do that. So, I mean, I could really get on my soapbox about the Postal Service, but I spent 38 years in there and loved it and would never change anything about it that I did. So when you first started, what was your day-to-day -day job, like your first year? Okay, I, I came in, there was so much mail to sort, you could never get it done. Um, you just cased, you know, sorted all the mail you could, got it prepared, dispatched it. It went out in sacks at the time, in canvas bags. And uh, then on the other side, the mail was coming in, you were getting it ready, uh, sorting it out. So we went to the mail carriers and uh, in Columbus, Ohio, for instance, um, the business sections got two and three deliveries per day per day. So if you were, say, in the downtown area of Cincinnati, Cleveland, wherever in the United States, you think about that. Every day you got at least two deliveries, and there were some sections of the town that they got so much mail that, and the way the trains ran, that the carrier went to that place of business three times a day. Now, a lot of people wouldn't know if the mail if the mail carrier didn't go today, you know, unless they're looking for something special. Now it's uh, text and email and uh, Facebook and on and on. But um, the businesses lived and died by the postal service in those days, so it was, it was a lot different. Yeah. What was um, was there anything that you liked when you moved up to being the postmaster? What was your favorite part of that? Well, actually, I, I think my favorite part was interacting with the people. Um, I, I learned through doing it, uh, basically, that that's, that was kind of my forte in life. Um, you know, some people were better suited for technology, some were better suited for whatever. But I, I seem to be suited, at least to me, I seem to make successes through other people. and. Um, I think that was kind of the, the really rewarding thing about my job. I could see that I was helping people and I could help, help them advance and help them learn their jobs and so forth. So that was, that was pretty much the biggest thing. So were you ever a, a mail carrier or were you always in the office? <clears throat> well, I, I was technically always a clerk, but I did have occasions on which I carried mail. Um, in those days, it wasn't as, unionized as it is now um, but you know if the boss wanted me to go out and, and carry a route where somebody got sick um, an example I remember going out and, and uh, getting people off the route who had had an, either a good thing happen in their family like a birth or a, a death in the family and you go out on the route and take their mail and finish the route that kind of carrying is I did that quite a bit. Did you like going out in the community like yes, that? Yes, I did. I liked it very much. Now I remember the things like, you know, rural carriers were a different breed and they still are, but I loved them. They, they, they're kind of the backbone of rural America. And they still are to, to a degree. But I remember the first time I carried a rural route, I was, I was postmaster at the time, but it was a smaller office and things were a lot different then, like I said. So we had a, a mail carrier that couldn't come to work, and she was very ill, couldn't come to work that day, and there was nobody else that I could find to take its place, so I carried it myself. Because I did have a clerk who I could put in my spot in the post office, so I was up a, a, <laughs> a dead-end road delivering on the last house and my car broke down. 
<laughs> Here I am with my suit and tie on, and I'm getting under my car and trying to fix it, and I could see the lady peeking out of the window because she was probably scared to death to come out there. Probably thought it was an FBI agent or something. But um, that was very memorable. So, but it was a, a very, very, it's just a great job. And recently, in the spring, I bought a house, and I went from being outside, more in the Memphis area, to being in the middle of Sayutaville. I still haven't gotten used to the differences. I can't just put things on the mailbox on the side of my house, and I don't know. It's just so different for me because I'm used to used to being out. And, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it is different. And I haven't gotten used to the people coming right up to the door, and I can hear them outside putting the things in the mailbox. Very strange Ooh, for me. Minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> well, you know, that's something else that um, the American people get that is, a, well, it's not available in every country, but uh, the Postal Service now, uh, they can save a lot of money by every delivery, like you just mentioned as a delivery, that they can put out on the street instead of on your porch. So that's the way for many, many years it's gone that way now, trying to get, like if you're familiar with Wheatersburg, the cluster boxes, they're centrally located around, see, Wheatersburg don't get door delivery. Most, they, they get very little door delivery. But in most cities, that's just unheard of. Everybody gets door delivery. And you take that away from them, if they've been used to it, it's the opposite of what you, you know, they want the door delivery. But, um, it's changing sooner or later down the road and there'll probably be no door delivery. But that'll be way down the road yet. So. It's very interesting because we're used to, I got used to listening for the car down at the end of the driveway mm -hmm. and the difference between, oh, it's time to walk down and get that versus and they're, as long as I've got you, when I haven't been able to figure out how they managed to weasel over the when they're driving to do that are they just really contortionist that they can get over the seat and <laughs> in that or no actually it actually it's it's uh, just something that you can learn rather quickly some people are just better than others but you're really driving um, you're sitting on the right hand side driving a car that's built for the left hand driver um, and most rural carriers opt to do that because they furnish the vehicle. See, they pay for the vehicle and the post office reimburses them through, through a, a, um, a bi-weekly uh, set sum of money based on evaluation of the route. And it's very expensive to buy like a British car uh, or an Italian version that's on the right side or it costs a lot more money to have it converted so I'd say 98% of the, all the vehicles in, in America that deliver mail are left-hand drive doing the right hand side but you really you know you, you use your foot brake and gas both which is technically you know it's allowed legally and then you're 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 steering with your left hand and of course you got automatic drive so um, it becomes just part of the job, you know, it really does. Um, one might think you would never learn that, but, it does, and you can reach out and, you know, so, no, it's, it's, it's odd, but, and statistically, accident-wise, rural carriers, while well, they're the most vulnerable and they're involved in some of the worst accidents because they get hit from time to time. Uh, their accident rate isn't any higher than, say, the city carrier rates um, that drive on the left side. So it isn't, it isn't just the way they're driving, um, but you know, it's, it becomes part of them, I guess, an extension of, of their abilities, and so you know, they do extremely well with it. I've always been really impressed with them, and I just can't figure out how they manage to yeah. to get themselves. And you can get into, you know, a lot of them go through the phases. I, I've seen so many of them. 
and they think, well, let me, you know, I'm, I'm going to get one of those gadgets where I can hook it up. And they work too, you know, they, they, for a few hundred dollars, you can have your car adapted so you can actually steer it over here and then shift and do, do stuff from over here. But after they've been a real carer, I'd say six months, that's all. They don't even think about it. They just move, I mean, they just do their job and, and they buy the, the most inexpensive car they can because any money they can save in that regard and it goes to their family. So you don't see them driving, uh, like I said, the, you know, the British cars with the right hand drive and all that stuff because it's just cost prohibitive. So. I find them impressive. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, before we kind of leave the U.S. Postal Service era of your life, yeah, do you have You, you can else? take me anywhere you want to. I'm just enjoying okay, it. Great. Um, so um, now you stopped being postmaster. You retired. How about how long ago? Uh, Ninety-three. Okay. What's been going on since then? Well, I, I kind of threw myself into two things. One is community work, and two... Uh, the rental property business, residential rentals. I had some and, uh, and I just got more and, and I did that. And that's, you know, that's taken a lot of, well, I'd had no slack time. With rental property and community work, a person's never gonna run out of work. <laughs> I tell you that. <laughs> so, but that's what basically what I've done. I've done some traveling, but by and large, I've, I've worked. It's just been in a different way. So you've um, you kind of a landlord to a lot of different places. Where um, now, had you ever had any experience with rental property, anything like that? Yeah, actually, um, the first house I bought in Columbus uh, when I was when I started working at the post office was a rental, the two family, and we bought it and um, and lived in part of it and rented the other part. And so it was, you know, it's, it's just something I kind of gradually graduated into. And then when I came back to Portsmouth, um, I kept the property in Columbus and and just added down here. And so most of my stuff is in Saiwe County. But um, I'm trying to get out of that now. It's, it's a lot harder to get out of it sometimes than it is to get into it. But um, my community work has been what I've really loved. Right. And I, I think that's just kind of saving it back because I know that's yeah, what we well, talked about on the phone. Um, go ahead. Um, what, um, what has been your favorite project that you've done? Well, my favorite, I, I guess I would have to say my favorite has been with the high school. Um, because I, I was fortunate enough to get uh, to meet and work with um, <clears throat> the Scioto Foundation, Kim Cutlip and the people there, and found out very close that that they're doing some extremely outstanding work for the community. And I thought, you know, just I would like to be a part of this. So um, I was already, you know, I was going to the annual banquets and so forth for the high school and all. But I decided, no, you know, I really need to do something more than that. So um, we put together, a, <clears throat> there were four of us put together a, um, a pretty good um, group of management and, and we did 10 years. We, we agreed when we started, you know, it was a one year thing. They, you get voted in every year, but we agreed among ourselves that if as long as we could get elected we would we would do it for 10 years and uh, one of our guys is still there I think he's um, he's about on his last year he was in my class and um, we started just raising money basically and uh, the foundation was so I mean they, they were just so wonderful in helping us I can't say it enough I mean and we were getting the same offer as all the other schools 
and we took it extremely seriously. Uh, our our team did. You know, we we started having fundraisers and auctions and so forth and so on. And now we we really do of all the the school funds and the foundation. Uh, I I'm pretty sure we have the the biggest. So. Uh, First of November will be our annual thing, and I'll be going to that. Now, I don't, I don't work in it anymore, but I enjoy it and I support it. So it's been wonderful. Yeah. That's my favorite. Got money. Yeah. And, and my next favorite would be the Roy Rogers thing. Yeah, yeah I know that that um, is a really big event. People come from all over the place to be a part of it. Now, um, I know you're a part of the festival. For a while, there was a, a museum starting. Were you involved with that at all? The Roy Rogers Museum when it was? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. We had, back uh, in the very beginning, um, we had a, um, a, a deputy registrar of Bureau of Motor Vehicles here named Don Gordley, who was um, another community-minded person. He and his wife, Mark, both. Uh, they donated a, a section of their uh, Fifth Street um, Bureau to us as a committee to put a hometown exhibit in, is what we actually called it. We never, we never went to the museum name because we didn't want to conflict with the Portsmouth Area Museum. We, in fact, we started out with that name and they conflicted right away and we all we all realized that so we we made some quick changes and and we named ourselves the Portsmouth area community exhibits and um, it was well like like a, the natural I mean Roy was he, he grew up in this area from the time he was a baby and everybody and we using the term loosely everybody loved Roy Rogers I mean that's kind of the expression that came down from the time I was 10 years old and, you know on up and <clears throat> so it's it was um, it was a, a good thing to do for the community but it was also very rewarding for me because it was something that I really connected with so it's kind of like the post office thing all over again except this time on community work and uh, <clears throat> see, Roy Rogers was filling uh, Madison Square Gardens and performing uh, for royalty in Britain, uh, and he had never had a homecoming in Portsmouth. But I mean, that's just the way things are. You know, uh, you're the last people to get recognized sometimes are the ones who who deserve it the most. But um, that's kind of one of the reasons we, we got started. And, uh, and you're involved with the festival with each year. Is uh, How long have you been involved with all of those? Well, <clears throat> it's easy if I, if I can just like start at the beginning. Um, in 1981, when I came back here as postmaster, I had a, a classmate who was actually a couple of years ahead of me in school at Clay, Elmer Sword, who was the local historian here and um, had done just about as much as one man could do trying to promote his hometown. So I think a couple weeks after I got it, he called me one day and he said, you know, I want to come down and see you. I want to come down and see you. So he came down and right away said, you know, I got some of these, I got some ideas, you know, we blah, 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 you know, we, we need to do. Well, we ended up calling him the idea man and the rest of us tried to hold him down and get done what we'd all agreed to. But um, he had this, this thing about he wanted to uh, honor and pay back a little bit to the people who had gone on from this area uh, to do bigger and better things for one of the, you know, the, I mean, not everybody can be an actor, not everybody can be an engineer or whatever, but everybody can can excel and, and help not only themselves, but their community and mankind in general. So, in 1981, uh, we, we embarked on this thing. There were four of us, and, and 
we kind of brainstormed for a long time and we just decided, okay, first let's find out how many people and who are they that we're talking about because we want to know what we're talking about, right? It ends up our list at that time was 97 people. I mean, like uh, the storm scope that's that's been used for decades to help pilots fly. The very first uh, thing was ever invented to help pilots fly, and when you can't see, Portsmouth, Ohio, the guy did that. Uh, so you go into all these different fields. Julia Morrow, one of the most famous Shakespearean actors, actresses ever. Uh, sports, um, engineering, um, business, um, insurance agency founders and CEOs, um, Branch Rickey uh, really has been given credit now through the years as being the father of professional baseball, signed Jackie Robinson. You know, he came from two miles from where Roy Rogers grew up. Uh, but everywhere you went, there was all these people, and uh, we thought, you know, I never heard this guy. And then that told us our own story. That, that told us. So that's what we started. We started, and we actually broke them down in groups. Obviously, uh, some of them had passed away. And some of them uh, were, at, at the time, they could, they could not get here. But we started by, by prioritizing and so forth, by actually having these people come here and honoring them with a dinner. And uh, just to say, hi, thank you, and this is your community telling you thanks for what, you, what you've done in your life. You're not getting any money for it, but we want you to know how much we appreciate it. So we, we did that, in fact, I think, Sometimes we'd have 10 or 12 at a time and have a big dinner and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> of course our number one hero was Roy. So we decided that we had to do something special for him. Again, I, like I said, you know, he had already been honored by filling Madison Square Gardens in New York City for God's sakes. And some people in this community didn't even know who he was. So, um, with the help of John Irwin, who was one of the founders uh, from, from AAA, and uh, George Clayton, who was a local business guy, and um, Elmer Sword, myself, and Zeke Mons, um, we sent a contingent to Roy's home in California with a with a book that had 10,000 signatures in it from the people of this area who wanted him to come home. Now, what you gonna say? He said, yes, right? So in the fall of 1982, we had our first Roy Rogers celebration. He came and, and then the following year, in 83, we did a, a big downtown um, Thing at Bank One, it was Bank One at the time on Esplanade, and had the Columbia Theater open and showed some movies of Roy, and we did a big birthday party that was in November of 82, I mean, 83. Then in, in the spring of 84, and every year thereafter, we did the Roy Rogers Festival. So it's been, you know, it's been, pushing 30 years now, so. Yeah, I was born in 83, that's, yep, a little over 30. <laughs> yep. Um, now, for the benefit of the folks who haven't been and don't know about the festival, what sort of things go on during that weekend? Mm, okay, uh, you, of course, now it's a lot different than it was then. But um, at the time, you know, when Roy was living and Dale was living, uh, his lots of his family came. Uh, we promoted um, we promoted the Western movie stars 
in general because that was our agreement with Roy because he nothing was written down he didn't do stuff that way you you had an agreement with him and that's what you did so we said okay we're not going to bug you to come we want you to always feel welcome but we will never call on you and demand on you anything to have you come here so we can make money so we can put it in a scholarship fund. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is have something and do those things. And we would just like your blessing and we would like for you to come as often as you can. So that's pretty much how it happened. So each year we would we would try to find some member of his family and so forth. And um, we would kind of make a central theme around that person and then we would bring other actors and actresses and so forth and we had parades and and uh, we had um, um, dealers that we called dealers they were really like vendors who would come and bring their wares and sell their memorabilia and so forth and so on but most of these people were also big time Roy Rogers fans not only I mean they weren't in it to make the money as much as they were in it to uh, perpetuate the Western star and to perpetuate Roy Rogers and his family so that's pretty much what we did every year and it was just kept growing and growing and growing and until the obvious ha is going to happen you know eventually um, Roy passed away and Dale passed away but now, see, Portsmouth, and I, and I said this, I know, in the last few years after Roy and Dale died, we, we still have a, a, a big part, uh, not only an obligation, but an opportunity, because we have his history. See, we, nobody else has that. Nobody. Nobody else has the history that Portsmouth has with Roy Rogers. So, that's what that's what the festival does now now i've been i i retired from it five years ago uh, but we have some really dedicated good people still in it uh, jane harold lily for two garnet davis and on and on there's uh, there's a lot of good people out there who really uh, spend endless hours a year working for the city in the area that they don't ask any thanks for but they help bring bring people here. So uh, that's pretty much what it is. It's it's a um, it's just an endeavor to uh, hold on to that history. Um, it's like Elvis now, you know. Uh, sure, Graceland's in Memphis, and Tupelo is right down the road. His hometown. They have his history, and that's that's why he's still alive today then it's the same with Roy they've always had his history and the more they propagate that and the more uh, they let newer generations learn about it uh, the better it is for the community so uh, like Roy's hometown or Roy's uh, home place out there uh, you know we did a, a a marker out there through the state of Ohio many years ago and I was fortunate enough to work on getting that done and, and it's been a, it's been a great thing you know people I've had people I've been in Columbus or Cleveland or they say you're from Portsmouth Ohio I, you know I remember reading something about Roy Rogers in Portsmouth and you know we went there and I saw that where he lived you know that's really rewarding when you hear that kind of stuff and you're in Cleveland or, or Tennessee or something so that's what it's all about yeah I was actually going to ask when you mentioned the the house, the home place. Um, I I know that in the past years you've done um, not a tour, but taking everybody that's there out to see it. Yeah, a tour. And, yeah. Oh, do you actually get to go in and what? I guess is anyone living there now? Or? Yeah. I'm, well, now now I'm speaking. Okay, I'm speaking from like three years removed. Now I don't know if it's sold in the last three years. Uh, okay, but uh, as of three years ago. Um, Somebody lived there. Some, some people lived there who were kind enough to allow the tour to come on the grounds. 
in the early years, uh, when we first started the festival, for the first, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12, and we actually had a little ice cream social out there. You know, we, we took them out and uh, made ice cream and, and sat outside and walked around and the neighbors came over and lots, lots of friends. You know, if you grow up with somebody like that, it's different than if you become a fan leader because these people knew him and grew up in, in the community out there around Otway and Duck Run. Well, they knew him in a different way, and that needed to come out. You know, there need to be some ways. So we re really encourage them to to come out and socialize and be a part of it, so they can meet uh, the people who um, loved Roy and loved him as an actor and or as a person. So. Uh, we did that. Um, we invited him to come in to the events. Um, so we tried to pull it, pull it all together and make it part of one big Portsmouth area. There was a lot in this area to be offered, and I'm glad that it's starting to, things are starting to happen, and that's good, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, <clears throat> again, the history we will always have. So I'm hope hopefully there will be somewhere in this county a uh, permanent place uh, to to honor Roy Rogers. And just like, and I use Elvis because most people, you know, if you flash forward a little ways, most people are going to quickly relate to Elvis. But as decades go by, those will wane and. But anyway, um, Roy Rogers was a unique person, and he, well, I guess he had a, he had a lot more to offer than just what he did in the movies. And when you met him, he would say, "I just don't know why people get so excited about this Roy Rogers thing." You know, I mean, that's just the kind of guy he was. He's, um, if you were sitting talking with him and somebody said something about taking a picture, okay, let me get my hat. You know, it was no, there was no uh, facade. There was no uh, pretentiousness. Um, it was just him. And uh, people loved that about him. So that was good. You know, you want people to, Oh, yeah, he's from Portsmouth. That's something special, especially where, you know, the fans, so to speak, could hang out with people that grew up with him. That's a really special opportunity that most people wouldn't get, wouldn't get to have. Right, and I got to see, are, are you from England, by the way? No. You have a British connection? Uh, my mom's side is Irish. I noticed you, you seem to have a little bit of British um, or Irish uh, accent at the ends of some of your words. Um, I, that's a, a peculiar string of things. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up here, I always had been. Um, and then I went to school in Columbus and I grew up and I always had the Southern Ohio sound. And I went to school in Columbus and I lost it really quickly. Okay. Yeah, and then I spent um, a couple years traveling and um, if somebody wasn't an English speaker originally, it's easier for them to follow if it's less accented. So, right. so I've kind of learned mm. that pattern. <laughs> well, it, it was, it, I asked you that because it was so great. Um, like we would be in, say, down at the Appalachian Festival in Tennessee. And there are a lot of British people go there because they love bluegrass. Well, uh, they would sing the old mountain songs right along with the mountain people. And we'd be standing around outside a restaurant or wherever we ended up that evening, and uh, you would say something about Roy Rogers, and they could tell you more about Roy Rogers, these people from, from England, than the average bear from 
Tennessee. So, I mean, that kind of stuff, and Italy was another place that had a lot of huge Roy Rogers fans. Uh, but anyway, that, and I know, I know the British really had a big, and that goes way back, you know, to, to the late 40s and into the 50s, 60s, 70s. They had a huge Roy Rogers uh, fan movement there. So I just I thought I'd throw that out. I thought maybe might might actually be from from there. No, um, it, it is funny though because I used to be a substitute teacher, and that was right after I finished up school and lived abroad for a year. Um, so it was much more pronounced that I, I I'm starting to get my accent back a little bit from being back here, and um, some of the kids thought I was from who knows where. <laughs> now where are you from, Mike? Where, where did you grow up? Well, in Scioteville, that's where. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great, though. But you have, so you've been out and experienced some some parts of the world, so, you know, mm. it's, it's interesting that that's, because I can pick up on, like, when uh, Brits, you just said something there, you, you, ended, you said the word thought, and then you said the word I, back to back, and, um, the, the Brits cut off the last sound of the T when they do that. You can't hear all the T. In fact, if you don't listen closely, you'll miss the last T of thought. It's the I. I mean, listen to Simon Cow if, if you want to know what I'm talking about. But that's, you know, you can pick that up from, mm -hmm. it's, just a it's just something you, you, you get and you don't even know you're getting it. I had friends, um, one friend from Yorkshire, and he would drive me up the wall because anytime he would, um, we spent some time in Russia, and anytime he was talking about Russia, it was Russia, and it really bothered me because it is not Russia, it is Russia. <laughs> yeah, right. It's just a, an accent thing. It would drive me up the wall. <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> I thought it was irritating. <laughs> and, and China and. <laughs> um, now I got to a couple years ago. I talk, got to talk to Don Davis. Oh, I know yeah. he was really Fantastic. involved. Superman, super guy. Oh yeah, he, he was a ton of fun. Um, and um, he was telling me that sometimes when Roy Rogers would come in, other people from the shows would come with him. Sometimes, did you ever get to meet any of the? Um, who was it? He told me. I don't remember his name, but he was a, a Native American man that was in... Iron Eyes of, Cody. Yes, Iron Iron Eyes. It was such an unusual name. Yeah, yeah he was telling me you he know, got to... We had to, him here in... Uh, uh, I'm thinking it might have been like 85. Anyway, it, you know, I, I can't remember all of them, but um, Iron Eyes was definitely a huge hit. So we brought him back. He came back again another year, but uh, the one did did he tell you about the trip to the forest with Iron Eyes? Don did Don tell you that story? Oh no. We know Don Don Davis in his own should be on this list for only none other than his photographs. Now, I don't know if you how many of you have seen. Oh, I, oh he he donated a couple to us and they were fantastic. Well, he has like he has like five hundred of those. We did a, a whole display on the, I think, I want to say the 30th anniversary of the Wheelersburg tornado because he had so many photographs okay, of yes, it. Okay, yes, he would have had. We got to see um, all of those and we got to, he donated um, the, the steel, mill, steel mill photo to us that he had taken at the very end of the steel mill. Yeah, was that when they were making that last mm -hmm. pour? Yes, he donated yep. a, a print of that to us. So I've got to see some of them, and I, I, they were really fantastic. Well, the, the, bringing it back to the Iron Eyes thing, um, he was a photographer for our group. And of course, he and his, his wife, Garnet, uh, you know, they, I mean, I bought his film. Basically, that was it. <laughs> the rest of it, you know, was them. But um, he was, he was with them when they went out. They took Iron Age Cody out in the forest in a limo. We always had a, a driver, and we always had a limo donated. But anyway, they stopped 
at a stream in a forest somewhere. And uh, they Iron Eyes got out and they all got out and they were just taking a stretch and taking a few pictures and so forth. So I guess Iron Eyes Cody walked down to near the stream and uh, somebody make a, made a remark, something about Indians and the water or, you know, whatever. It was not a negative remark. It was so he, he, I guess he, he knelt down on one knee and scooped up some of the water and drank it. And Don got his picture. And uh, it was so, it was so like connected to his famous picture with Lady Bird Johnson um, for the tear, you know, him standing in a canoe. Uh, I mean, he was just, he had that in his heart. So when somebody said about something about the water, that was precious to him. And he just and exclaimed about how good it was. I mean, you know, that's you can't you, you can't make up stuff like that. You either have that or you don't have it. But Don got that got that photo. That was one of his great ones. Along with Dolly Parton and Jimmy Carter and I know he personally, I know he had over 300. So, you know, brilliant guy, super, super photographer. Chased the American Queen, uh, the new paddle boat, all the way from Maysville to Pittsburgh to get the right picture. He did. He went, he, you know, no, I didn't like that. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. But I guess when you're taking pictures, there aren't that many places between Cincinnati and Pittsburgh that there isn't a telephone wire or something that makes the the paddle boat look out of date. Mm -hmm. And he was looking just for, he just wanted the water and nature. But he finally got, so that's among his collection. That's good. Oh yeah, he was a great guy. He was. Anyways, um, sometimes he would just pop in, and I, it always made me smile when he just kind of came in and <laughs> and hung out with us back in the the offices for a little while. Just uh, mm -hmm. when he when we were doing the Wheelersburg tornado display, and when we were doing when we were working on projects with him. Right. He would just kind of pop in, hang out for a little while, and. I always liked those days. Oh yeah, and you know he did a lot of community work uh, for Ashland too. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Highlands uh, Museum up there and the art stuff, but he did a lot of work for them. They were they were lucky to have him up there on helping them, and they had a big undertaking to come up with their the Paramount whatever it is, I don't know, really know the exact name of it, but it's uh, connected with the Paramount Theater up there. So, you know, he's done, he's done a lot of work over the years for communities. We went to that museum in high school for one of our field trips. Did you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was very cool. I liked it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very, very nice. Very nice. Now we've covered, we did Postal Service, we've done Roy Rogers Festivals, we've done uh, Community Volunteering with Clay. Um, I definitely don't want to cut you off short. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? I don't want to... Well, I really, did, I, you know, I really didn't come here to just talk about myself. Um, basically, I think one of the things that we need to cover is um, how our, our group, our early group, pulled all, all that stuff together. Great. Um, see, we started with, um, the, it, was, it was the Roy Rogers homecoming. And then, um, after deciding, which was, it was no, a no-brainer, after deciding we have to do something every year for Roy, while at the same time we're doing these dinners and so forth, like, Vern Reif, another guy that we haven't even talked about. Um, you know, we did a, a, a dinner at Shawnee State, 810 people sit down dinner for, for Vern when he, when he retired. The governor came and our organization 
along with the insurance and Burns family, I made sure that happened. And uh, then we had, um, I mentioned the Portsmouth Area Museum, a little bit of conflict there in the name. Um, we had the recognition thing in general. And then we had like the outstanding people like Roy and, and um, Ted Strickland and um, well, there's there's so many of them. Um, Branch Rickey, that's who I, was, I mentioned earlier. We talked about him, but <clears throat> we decided that there should be uh, some kind of you know to bring all this together under an umbrella. So. That's when we, we formed the Portsmouth Area Community Exhibits, and as far as I know, it's still active today. And uh, we brought that under it all together. We, you know, in 1986, we published the uh, history of Scioto County under the auspices of Portsmouth Area Community Exhibit. I'm sure you've seen the book if you, if you work at the library. Yep, we have it in our local history. Yeah, okay, so um, we, have, we did the book. Um, we we were a um, bit of a surrogate for the Portsmouth murals uh, right in the early years uh, that Bob Morton was the key player in that and we helped them get started you know we because they did not have their um, 501c3 designation they found out it's a little more difficult to get but we had it, so we paid their bills and kind of took them in for a little bit, um, just financially and so forth, until they could get, get their feet on the ground. And uh, the STARS thing, uh, our group, I mean, it was like that was a spinoff, I think is the right word. I wondered if those two A spinoff from, from those early years, because so many people on their individual uh, efforts had um, pointed they would point out you know well maybe you know uh, uh, like gene tennis or uh, some well-known sports figure or, or whoever uh, somebody should recognize it you know somebody should well um, that that kind of spun off from um, from our group from the early 80s and um, I, I mean, it was great to see that happen. Um, we did, um, for a few years, we even did the, the Miss Portsmouth thing because they were stumbling and uh, we did two of those that I remember until they got somebody to back them again. But it was really great to be able to do that. Um, and we saw, like, there was four of us guys that met at Jones's restaurant which I don't know if you remember Jones is on 2nd Street back in the early 80s. And um, like I said, Elmer Sword was the, he was the idea guy. And he wanted, he would have loved to have seen Portsmouth, uh, the capital of the world, you know. But um, no, it, we, we were able to pull all that together and watch other things grow from, from it, so that was, that was really the only thing else that I would have to, to talk about. That's really wonderful. And for the benefit of the recording, the, the stars you mentioned are on the flood wall, uh, where people that have made a, a um, significant, a real contribution to um, their field, whatever that happens right. to be, sign uh, one of the painted stars up on the flood wall. And that's really that's really cool. I wondered if those two were related. The the appreciation dinners and the, the star signatures. Well, I know that our, our list of 97, <clears throat> you know, we, we, uh, we worked some long and hard hours on that. And I know that that list was consulted time and time again. Because you can't just give people a, a list of names, you know. You, in other words, we, we had checked them out. We knew uh, for sure that credit that people were getting was justified and so forth but um, yeah that our list was used many many times on that uh, it doesn't really matter I don't think and that that was my 
opinion from the beginning. I don't, I don't care who does the selections. I just want them made. Because number one, it's never going to be the same people forever. But there's going to be new people indefinitely coming on who, who need to go on that wall. So it, it just needs to be a group of Portsmouth people who are interested in preserving that and pushing it forward and so forth. But as to who makes this, I mean, I've some people have some problems with uh, who's making the selections now and who made them before and so it doesn't really matter as long as somebody is making them and it keeps going. That's what that's what we wanted. So, yep, that was that was a definitely a spinoff from from uh, those early years, and uh, we got so much help from businesses and things that you could never thank everybody enough, you know. Um, but I, I think it made a difference in. Um, well, it may, it may, I, okay, for, uh, here's an example. I was at the brew pub a couple of weeks ago, having some wings, okay? And there's a couple sitting on the end from us, and we're all just talking. And um, it's like, well, you know, where are you from? Uh, Pittsburgh. So, okay, you know, we told them where we were from, and eventually it, you know, if you if you're getting a friendly conversation, it gets a little deeper. It's like, uh, you know, how did you happen to end up at Portsmouth today? And she she says, well, uh, yesterday we were just sitting there having breakfast, and we decided to take one of our impromptu trips. So. Um, they decided this time they were just going to drive in the general direction of Kentucky from Pittsburgh. So they meandered down through wherever, wherever. And they ended up down, it was south of Maysville. So then the guy says, and I remembered something about Roy Rogers and Portsmouth. So we came to Portsmouth. So they they done two days here, and they were going to stay another day, and they said it would be back. Now, see, those people, who knows, they may have never come to, they had never been to Portsmouth before, and probably had never planned to come to Portsmouth, but now they're coming back. So, you know, that's, that's one incident, but I'm not the only one that runs into that. There are other people that run into that, and so, you know, that's, that's very re rewarding to, to have that happen to you. And know that they had a good time when they were here and they were staying at the at the Holiday Inn and that they were to brew pub and, got, and discovered the oldest uh, brewery in, in the, <clears throat> the state of Ohio. They didn't know that. They were they loved their beer drinkers. They loved beer. But uh, it is. Yep, it's the oldest one in the state. And um, thanks to a local guy who, and I don't even know the man, Steve Malt, who, who bought it and, and sunk a lot of his money into it, I'm sure. And there were probably times when he said to himself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You know? um, but that's why. So that the community, you know, it lives on. I knew that they had recently started brewing again. I've seen uh, at different restaurants, they'll have a little card out that advertising the, the Portsmouth Pilsner and um, the the specialty, I don't know, versions <laughs> there from the, yeah, the right. brewery. And well, I don't know if you're a beer drinker, but even if you're not, whether you are not, uh, port, they make some a couple of really good beers. One of them is, is the Red Bird Ale, which, I mean, just about every college student will drink one of those at least one while they're here and like it. I mean, I, I just know that anyway. Um, and then there's a Vulcan, which is a dark beer, which is, I prefer dark beer. But um, it's right up there with the best of the best. I mean, I've I've had dark beer all over 
the country, and they just don't make it much better than that. Now we've got an enforcement, but um, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's probably going to be around for a while now, thanks to the right person, God. It's, there were a couple of three other uh, attempts, and people meant well and spent their money, and but it just didn't take. But now, uh, since uh, since Mr. Malt got it, uh, it seemed to be taking on a general. First thing you have to do is satisfy the local. You've got to be able to exist year round, and then you add all the people coming here to visit. And so it's you know it's great. I'm really happy to see that. I was I was surprised when I started seeing. The, the little advertisements in the different restaurants and then I think it, I first saw it at Toro Loco and then didn't see it again and then I started seeing it other places and that's that's really neat that it's able to keep growing like that that's cool yes and the the craft beer thing of course has become a, quite a phenomenon um, over the, well actually the past five years or so it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger but um, it's good to force my scut they're in on that, you know. I, uh, the sole um, connection, you know, the shoe company here that you just read not long ago, um, they've got a contract they're doing shoelaces in the old uh, Mitchell Lace building. I, is it, um, are they blue? Yeah. I jumped on that project. Um, I saw that online on, um, Kickstarter or something like that, and I saw. Kickstarter is a good one. My yeah. granddaughter did Kickstarter for her thing. She did a, she did a fashion design. Mm -hmm. She graduated with her master's degree from uh, Maryland Institute of Technology or of Art. But um, that uh, that Kickstarter is amazing, oh, especially, yeah. especially for younger people. I mean, and they need a break. God knows, and just give it to them. Yep. And I really, I saw that um, one of the, a lady that used to be a librarian here had posted about this project that was going on that um, it was, a, it's a project that if you are wearing blue shoelaces, that means you would choose to buy American. Yes. So it promotes <clears throat> American manufacturing. And so I saw that and I was like, oh yes, click. And um, I loved it. The more I read about it. Um, I was. I thought it was amazing. I thought it would probably do, you know, a, a little couple buck donation to help. Um, but then when I found out, when I read through it, and found out, oh, it's here in Portsmouth. I, I, you know, donated enough. I've got my my blue shoelaces with the metal tips, and they're very there fancy. There you go. And um, and I I tried to get a hold of. I emailed back and forth with the the two men that were running the project, but. Uh, they were doing some work down here, didn't have time to, I told them, you know, I work at the library, I'll take you around, I'll show you everything, but they had things to do, so. Well, I don't know if you're talking about the CEO and and the, and him, the guys who own the company, mm -hmm. and Nelson Smith, he lives about half a block from me in Rubyville. Okay. And that I was going to bring up that there's another case of where now the right person's got that now. Okay. That's, that's what you're talking about. And he and the other guy, I didn't I did not know the other man. But I knew Nelson, I knew his fat knew his mom. His mom, fantastic lady, had uh, the gift shop at the Ramada Inn for many years, Wanda. But okay, there I don't know. It's just something about the Midwest people. They can make stuff like that happen. They got it here, they got it here. And they can make stuff happen, and so I, I, I really expect to see a lot more growth from uh, from this company now, and more jobs. And I've been watching that particular project. I'm anxious to see what becomes of it, and I couldn't believe that a lot of folks around here hadn't heard of it, uh, the, the Blue Shoelace Project. I thought, my goodness, yeah, well, why are we not all you know, standing on our rooftop saying, hey, we've got this amazing thing. Yeah. And uh, Bill is the other guy's first name. I 
can't, I've never met him, but anyway, he was in, um, he was in Washington, D.C. to testify um, on behalf of uh, the company and what they're doing. So, yeah, those guys, these guys are the real deal. They're real Midwestern Americans they're from Scioto County. And if it's humanly possible, they'll make it happen or they won't give up. Uh, they, I mean, that's just the way it'll be. That's just the way it is, <laughs> you know. And it's really funny. <clears throat> I, tra I traveled a lot in the Postal Service and worked, and it was very re rewarding to meet other people, other managers and so forth, from all different parts of the country. But I, I, I would be the quickest to tell you, and maybe not to tell an outsider, that the people who have gone the farthest, the quickest, and done the best are Midwestern people. I mean, that's just my own little survey thing. But, you know, like, um, I kid my son-in-law, he's from Lorain, Ohio, and does Northern Ohio versus Southern Ohio, you know, we're rednecks and so forth and back and forth. And uh, <clears throat> so he, he got, a, he's, his job is a pretty highly technical job. He's in the medical field. He does uh, pacemakers and catheters and you know the high-end life-saving stuff defibrillators and all this so um, he was always telling me how great his boss was and um, you know I you know this this went on for several years you know. so one day we were talking and I don't know why I asked that day but I said uh, what's what's your boss's name uh, Gary Blanton. And I said, hmm, sounds like a Midwestern name. I said, where's he from? Ashland, Kentucky. <laughs> and I said, of hmm, you mean he's a redneck? And Paul goes, ah, yeah, you're right, Dad. He's a redneck. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of that's kind of my point rolled up in that little story, but. Uh, there. When you go, you look around, you question, you find that, not all of them obviously, but the larger percentage uh, versus statistically what it should be and what it really is, uh, it's going to be the Midwestern uh, mindset, uh, whether it's, uh, I don't know, it, it can't just be intelligence because there's more intelligence in some parts of this country. Uh, but anyway, it's got something to do with, with um, you know, born and bred and how you're raised and what your values are and you mix all that together and add in your genes and whatever. But a uh, large disproportionate uh, percentage our Midwestern people. I'm talking, you know, Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, um, the western part of Virginia at least. So, anyway, I could stay here all day. <laughs> well, I won't make you stay here all day. <laughs> I do appreciate you coming down and talking to me and letting me tape you even though you didn't know you are going to be on video today. Right, yeah, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Uh, Good. And. Um, I'm, I always want to extol the values of Portsmouth people and uh, what they're capable of and so forth. I mean, it's just, it's been very gratifying to me having gone out and say the first 30 years of my life and then come back and so forth. Um, it's just very rewarding to see in the community when so many of them have had s such a meek uh, opportunities and so forth. Uh, the people at Clay now have a great opportunity that they, that they never had before. But last year, uh, this might sound boastful for the group, 
the little town, the little Clay High School gave 21 scholarships of $1,000 a piece. You check the rest of them. I don't think they did. I don't think anybody came close to it. But when, when our organization took it over, our group, that's been almost 15 years ago now, they were giving three $500 scholarships. So now they give them 21, $1,000. And I told their new president, um, who, who, by the way, is a young man, he's like three or four years out of high school, I told him that he has an opportunity in his lifetime to make sure that every student coming out of Clay who wants to go to college, you can write him a check. Because he's, he's just on the cusp, he doesn't know it yet, of the new money that's coming from the baby donors. And I think Chillicothe already got some big grants. I mean, they're talking, well, Portsmouth, Portsmouth got one. They got $10 million to do this athletic complex. That's how, that's how the clerk, the clerk people donated $10 million. That's the kind of money that it takes to do what you see that, that happened here in Portsmouth plus the help and the work that all the local people do to like Ralph Applegate and some of the people who are who worked on that um, but that's that's coming there there's going to be money like that out, out there and I told him you know it's your job how to get it you got to find it because it's there somebody who graduated from clay somebody some benefactor who who sees what has been done there and what's happening to their money and how you're growing and so forth. They're going to come up to you someday and say, how would you like to have $5 million? Or what would you do with $5 million? Because it's happening. And I just said, I want to make sure, you know, I want to make sure you're thinking about that. Don't just be thinking about everything in the little box now. Uh, so, yeah, I can see it happening. And it's, it's going to help a lot of people, especially in areas like this, who, who really don't. They, they, let's just put it this way. The opportunity isn't there, whether it's their fault or not their fault. It's immaterial to that. But the opportunity that might be, say, in Columbus or Cincinnati or, or somewhere else, isn't in Portsmouth normally, but that can change. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that, as you can probably tell. There's certainly good things happening, and I'm glad to see them happening. Yes, very much. Very much so. Well, again, I don't want to cut you off. So, if there's anything else you wanted to, no, I, no, I, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm good. I've talked right. too much probably. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much.